seated on a rock somewhere or, or standing and God is bringing all of the animals by him for him to name. Now there probably wasn't as many varieties then as there is now but there was all the basic kind were there so uh, that was quite it's a good thing that he was uh, perfectly intelligent uh, and as you can see there it looked like there was a probably a great relationship between him and the animals for God had told him that he would be ruling over them and that doesn't mean just watching them it means uh, ruling over them so so he named all the animals but and I'm sure that probably God may have had this in mind after all of these animals have been brought by him he he realized that none of those were like him not a single one of them were like him and God said uh, that it, uh, it wasn't good for man to be alone. So he said, I will make him a helper suitable for him. So God took one of the ribs out of Adam's body and closed up the skin and the flesh and then took that rib and he fashioned it into a woman. And the, the way, the reason that she got that name woman was because when Adam first saw her, he said, whoa, man. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but actually he was very, uh, shall we say, bedazzled. Uh, and, and he was absolutely delighted uh, with what God had made for him. And so he said, this is now bone of my bones. None of the animals were like that. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. All right, so let's skip ahead uh, a little bit. Actually, before we skip ahead, let's, let me just backtrack a little bit because the Lord had given Adam one prohibition, just one. The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. All right, so now we skip forward. I don't know how long, probably not very long, but maybe a couple of days or maybe a few weeks or any of that is just a complete guess as to how long this was. But another character enters this story. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, or has God really said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. You know, a lot of people try to make this story out as something different. A lot of people treat it as though it were a myth. A lot of people say it's an allegory. Uh, a lot of people reduce it to something that, like what you would see in a comic book. But the truth of the matter is that this world as we see it in all of its shame and darkness, well, it all goes back to this one event. Wars, murders, rapes, thievery, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, prejudice, 
betrayal, adultery, birth defects, illnesses, death, and the list could go on and on. It all traces back to there. You know, a lot of times people say, well, why, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, my first question is, what's your definition of a good person? But the real answer to that is, bad things happen to all people. And the reason is because of this. Sin entered the world through Adam, through his sin, all of his descendants forever pass away. Now, I want us to think just a little bit about this thing this morning with these thoughts in mind. First of all, who was this serpent? There is actually some controversy. I, uh, I, I had heard of this before, but I hadn't really read about it much until recently. But apparently some of the, some of the Jewish rabbinical literature claims that it was just a talking snake and nothing, nothing else to it. It was just a jealous talking snake <laughs> that decided that I didn't like man being the boss. But I think most of us probably realize that there was another character involved here. We don't know for sure if, if Satan em, embodied as a snake or if somehow he was possessed a snake. We don't know the answer to that question, but the Bible makes it really clear that Satan was the tempter that was behind uh, this whole thing. And the Bible even says in more than one place, calls the devil the serpent. So the imagery here is clear that, that this snake was in some way the devil or the devil was behind it. It wasn't just a jealous snake. Now, what do you make of the fact that this snake was talking to Eve? You know, um, it, it, it does not seem as though Eve was surprised or shocked that this snake was talking to her. I imagine probably Marla would be in quite surprise if she saw a snake and it began to speak to her. <laughs> well, it's time to get to hole anyway, whether it talks or not, I guess, but, uh, but especially if it talks. Well, some people have speculated that some of the animals or even all of the animals could talk before sin came into the picture. I don't know. I don't necessarily have an opinion one way or another, but I would say it's possible. It's definitely possible. That, I mean, the fact that she didn't show any surprise about that would either say that she was used to the idea or uh, perhaps that uh, she just hadn't been around any snakes and so she didn't know that this snake uh, shouldn't be able to talk. But you can just go, you know, figure that out yourself, what you think about it. I'm just kind of telling you that I think it's possible, but but I don't know. But one thing we do know is that the snake, his appearance was way different before this because it wasn't until after sin and after the curse that God placed on the serpent that it was reduced to, to uh, uh, slithering along the ground. So what did it do before? Before it slithered across the ground, what did it do? Well, we don't know. Did it have legs? Did it have wings and fly? Did it stand upright? We, we don't know. Did it have four legs like a lizard? We just, we don't know what it looked like, but we do know it was different uh, than after the curse. And, you know, I really think that the, the aspect of the curse where uh, there was... Uh, there was enmity put between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Uh, that is prophetic of Jesus, but it's also very, very true when it comes to my wife Marla <laughs> and, and Renee. And I can't really say that I care for them all that much myself. I've never been one of those that, you know, that drapes them around my neck or anything like that. Some, so, some people like it. And that, that's just not my thing. So um, if, you, uh, if, you, if you do that, uh, just make sure that your snake is full when you do it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
What was this, what was this tree? <clears throat> well, the name of this tree, I think, explains why and how all this worked. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, uh, there's no reason why we would have to say that this tree was particularly evil. It, it, it probably wasn't really any different than any other tree. It was in the middle of the garden. But you know, God, God could have chosen any tree and have made the same commandment and it would have worked for any of them because it wasn't the, the nature of the fruit. You know, it didn't have poison in it. You know, did, you know, it didn't have sin worms throughout all the apples. I don't know if it was an apple or not, but it was fruit on a tree, so I like apples. Sounds good to me. So, and it didn't have knowledge of good and evil juice. All right? You know, like where you, you bite it and you're like, oh, I got knowledge of good and evil juice all over my face. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't that. It was simply the command of God that made it what it was. Don't eat of that tree. Don't eat of that tree. And so when Adam and Eve did eat of it, then they experienced evil by, by disobeying the command of the Lord. What was this temptation? I have read a lot of people who tried to say that that this is nothing but an allegory, that this story is just a, it's just some kind of symbolic thing that, you know, happened and, and really isn't a very good explanation for how sin got started. And I've always wondered, why, why is it not literal? Why would we have to take it some other way? Because disobeying one command is disobeying another command, right? And so if this was just an allegory, you know, maybe somebody will say, say, well, I mean, what's wrong with eating an apple? Are you really trying to tell me that all this horrible stuff that goes on in the world is because some dude and his wife ate an apple? Well, my question to that would be, what other sin was available to them? You know, adultery? Nope, wasn't anybody around to have adultery with. You know, thief, stealing? Nope. Wasn't anybody else around to steal from? You know? And, and so, you know, as we know that disobeying one command is going to get you in the same trouble as disobeying another command, so there's no reason in the world why this should not be taken completely literally. Right? There was a command. It was the only command that was given, and they broke it. So, this temptation... It, it, has, uh, it has some various aspects to it. So I want to kind of break this down because there, the, basically every element of the temptation to sin that Eve and Adam experienced, every one of those elements are things that we experience all the time. The, the basic nature of temptation and the basic nature of sin has not actually changed. So let's kind of take a look at it. The serpent, as we read this, serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Now, that was only true in the sense that she did not experience physical death that day. But death became a process that became active in her, and so death entered Adam and Eve that day. They immediately began to grow older. And so we experience that, and the older we get, the more we experience it. So all you young fellows, it's coming. <laughs> the serpent said, you, you surely will not die, for God knows that the day, the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, was that true? Well, it was partially true because it was true that they would know good and evil. But you, and, and God understood good and evil more than they did. But the part of this that was a complete lie was that 
knowing good and evil would make them like God. And you see, it was, I don't think it was the knowing good and evil part. I think it was the being like God part that really uh, reached out to Eve and, and, and tempted her. So how does that live on today? First temptation goes with us just as well. And, and that is that the Satan, he raised a question in Eve's mind. Is God holding out on me? Is God keeping something back from me? Now, I'm going to say that I, I would just about be willing to, if I was a betting man, I would put down a, a $100 bill that everybody in this room has at one time or another asked that question. Is God holding out on me? You know what that is? That is unbelief. It's, it's unbelief in the, in the character in the faithfulness of God. Because if we believe that, that He is holding out on us, then that would mean that there was some kind of lack of love on His part. You know, and I'm not saying that God gives us everything we ever want. He gives us what we need, and He gives us much that we want, but that's not how we see it when we secretly ask that question and you may not have asked this question a lot or it may not have lasted a long time in your mind but I know that I have asked this question in my mind before is God holding out on me and so that is uh, a lack of faith and what was it that Paul said what whatever is not of faith is sin so unbelief is the is the root of every sin or there's something better than what God offers me. There's something better than what God offers me. We see that today in, in really most, if not all, of the temptations that we experience, but especially uh, the, the, the temptations that we would call vice. Like, for example, um, God created a desire and a need in human beings for something that we call sex. Satan would love it for us, for, for us to try to fulfill that in a way besides the way God provided for it. Now how did God provide for it? He provided marriage. And, and the, the best way and the only righteous way to experience this great, great joy that God has given is in faithful monogamous marriage. So uh, the world, though, would have you to believe that as soon as you get married, that all the fun stops. They, they, I'm, I'm not kidding you. That's what they, the world wants you to believe. And you can see that in, in, in television shows or whatever. You know, they make it out like that once you get married, all, all of a sudden it just becomes boring and, and flat and you just kind of, you know, forget about it. So, so, you know, enjoy it while you can. That's thinking that something is better than what God offers me. Or, you know, there's the, why wait? Now, I'm, I picked out that example because it's so prevalent, but there's all kinds of hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions of other examples that I could give you for that. There's something better than what God offers me. Uh, let's just say, uh, for example, that, uh, that a man feels like perhaps that God would, would have him to, to go into ministry, but he realizes that there's a good chance that he probably won't make as much money in that field and so he chooses to to resist that and to pursue what he has chosen that he believes will give him more money see that's believing there's something better than what God offers me so th those things they they are very prevalent in the temptation that we experience and then there's you know wow I can become a goddess or a god which whatever the case may be this too is something that I think we experience. Now, some of you are probably thinking, now, I don't really want to be a goddess or a god, but the, there's a kind of a sneaky underlying attitude 
uh, behind this that comes in and we would never use those words to say it but it's it's still there because well there's two actually a couple of ways I can think of that this works out one is I think that this shows up in in the attraction that we have sometimes to to superpowers and I'm not saying that it's wrong for you to watch Superman on the movie or you know I'm not saying that that's wrong but I think that there's kind of this little attraction to that that makes us wish you know I wish I had superpowers or you know maybe it's that or, or the force you know how you know you've always wanted to be a Jedi Knight right or at least to be able to you know reach out and you know and then suddenly it's in your hand well you know that's kind of what it is but even more than that is our desire to be a, a god or a goddess is shows up in our desire to be worshipped. Now you might not think I don't want to be worshipped, but what if we change the word just a little bit to admired? Yeah, don't we all want to be admired? Now I'm not saying necessarily that wanting to have some kind of admiration you know I mean it's it's nice to know that you're being effective but just the pure and simple desire to be admired that's kind of like a lower elementary form of desiring to be worshipped now let me ask you this how many young men do you think dream about being the MVP of the Super Bowl a lot what about uh, how many young ladies uh, dream about um, uh, becoming a, a, a supermodel or an actress or, or uh, you know, a beauty queen, something of that nature? And, and, and what is it that sparks that? Well, I think that these young people, that they see that those people who are in those positions, that they get a lot of admiration, and we want that admiration for ourselves. Now, the, the degree to which that is active in you, I do not know. I know that it has been very active in me at times in my past, so I can really relate to it, but I know that all of us have that to a certain degree. And so, you know, wow, I, 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 can, be, I can be a god if I, just, if I just eat this apple, if I just do this thing. Now, we, we know that the, the capstone of this sinful act was done not when Eve ate, but when Adam did. The Bible is very clear that Eve was deceived and that Adam wasn't. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.14, it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But then we see back in Genesis, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. You know, some people think that Adam was someplace far away when this happened, and she ate it, and then she gathered a bunch, and she went wherever Adam was, but that's not what this says, does it? And so the question I'm asking is, why didn't he, why didn't he say something? You know, why didn't he interrupt that? For that matter, if Adam was not deceived why did he eat the fruit if he was not deceived why did he eat the fruit well I have an opinion that's all I can give you is an opinion I, I do think my opinion is well grounded I do think I'm right because obviously if I didn't think it was right I would change my opinion <laughs> there you go yeah but anyway, this is what I think. You just have to kind of take it that way. But before I can say that, I need to ask another question. What would have happened if she had eaten but Adam didn't? What would have happened? Well, we don't know what would have happened. Is it possible that there would have, uh, the world would have been filled with godly men and wicked women? <laughs> <laughs> Would, uh, would God have just killed her? Or, you know, maybe banished her? 
Or would it just be that their, their relationship would have been ruined because, you know, Adam would have been innocent and she would have been sinful? You know, 800 years later, Adam still looks like he's completely in his prime, but Eve, she's just this really old, uh, wrinkled old woman. So I don't know what, what would have happened if that was the case. What I do know is that there was some reason why Adam decided to go and do it. Now, here, here's what I think it was. I think that Adam didn't want to live without her. Now, know what you're thinking. Aww. But let me tell you something. There was nothing honorable. There was nothing noble about that decision. If, if I'm even right. If that's even why he did it. But, uh, he, you know, it... The way I see it, he probably knew what was going to happen. He didn't know what this death would entail. He just knew that uh, that, that was going to happen, and she had eaten it, and it was inevitable. And, well, he just, just, didn't want, he just didn't want to be in a position without her as his wife. And so what did he do that made this so dishonorable? Well... He chose to love the creation more than the Creator. By, by choosing to do what He did in, in order that He can be in the same boat as she was in, He chose to love the creation more than, the, more than God. He loved Eve and put her above God in His priorities. Now that's also something that we do all the time. Loving the creation more than the creator. It can be a person or it might not be a person. It might be, you know, some things. But we, we just tend to love the gifts more than we love the giver. And I know that we have all experienced that at one time or another. So... No, there was nothing honorable. There was nothing noble about his decision. He, he put her before God. And because he did, then the world has suffered ever since. This is kind of what Jesus was talking about in Luke 14 when he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, was Jesus really saying that we have to hate our families? No, because that would go against, you know, thousands of other statements of Scripture. What he was saying was, is that we cannot put anybody or anything above God in our priorities. We cannot overshadow him in any way. Now, this isn't the only way that the word hate is used like that. You know, I say, well, it says hate. But it wasn't meaning like, you know, a guy goes around going, oh, I just can't stand that woman. It meant that in our priorities, in our choices, that God always comes first. And that may not sound all that romantic to you, but let me tell you something. It's the only way that a romance will ever work is if God comes first. You see, if, if both a husband and a wife are making uh, God a priority, and you've probably heard this before, you know, that the, here's God, the closer we get to God, the closer we get to each other, right? And so there's, there's not really a limit that God has set on how much you can love each other, or, you know, parents, children, friends, there's no limit on that. It's just that the love for God has to come first. The priority of God has to come first. And so what he did, what Adam did, was he ignored what he knew was right in order to maintain something with Eve. Now, how many husbands or wives have compromised what they know to be right in order to maintain some kind of peace or, or some, something like that. I think that what we learn here from Adam is that it doesn't work. Sooner or later, that's going to come crashing down. So, 
My love for God must be first. And I do not let anything come between. You know, is it, what was the first commandment? Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. That wasn't just talking about statues. It was talking about anything. Because if, if your husband or your wife or your, your friend, if they become more important to you than God, then you've just made them your God. You've just broken the first commandment. The most basic thing in the entire world, the most basic thing of God's law. Don't have any gods before me. Don't have any gods before me. Love the God, Lord your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is the key. That's the cornerstone of everything in life. And so, we must learn to maintain that. So, this is how the story has progressed. God created everything. God created all the plants and animals and sea creatures and light and everything. Created man. He made a woman from man. He gave them a commandment and they broke that commandment. And we've only gotten through the first three chapters of the Bible here. All this has happened and we've only covered three chapters. So the entire rest of the Bible is telling the story of what God did to rescue a people out of this bondage of sin. It took this much scripture to tell us how we got in this mess and it takes this much to describe what God did about it. So with this, this in mind, then the thing I think we need to ask this morning is, as we have talked about these aspects of temptation that have, that have remained until this day, then we should ask ourselves, do I ever think that God is holding out on me? Do I think that there's really that's something better than what God offers me? Do I have unbelief like that? Is my desire to be admired, and yes, I'm going to use the word worshipped even though you won't, might not use it. Is my desire to be worshipped, is it consuming me? I mean, that's, that's what Satan's sin was. He wanted to be worshipped instead of God being worshipped. That's why he did what he did. Or am I allowing things or people to take priority over what I know is right and what is godly? Have I compromised what I know to be right in order to maintain in some way a, a relationship? Those are the things that Adam and Eve experienced. Those are things that we also do today. You know, in 1 John, it talks about uh, temptation, describes it as the, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. Is that not what we see in the temptation back in the garden? Lust of the flesh, the fruit was desirable, it was, it was beautiful. Uh, the, the lust of the eyes... Uh, it, it appeared good as it had, a, it had a wonderful appearance and the boastful pride of life. Uh, I can be like God's. Very prevalent. I'm hoping this morning that if we can understand that these things, these aspects of temptation are at the root of some of the things that we experience, that it will arm us with some information to be able to fight off that temptation but uh, the true way to overcome temptation of course is to rely on the Holy Spirit of God so we examine our lives we see what's amiss we ask ourselves penetrating questions like am I, am I letting somebody derail me from what I know to be right in God's will or am I for that matter, am I pushing somebody to compromise what they know to be right? You know, those are, those are tough questions. A am I treasuring my possessions so much that I 
I put them ahead of the one who gave them to me. You know, when Jesus said that about uh, hating your father and your mother and your wife and all those others, he also said, and even your own lives, even your own lives, that God takes precedence over all of that. This may not sound like I'm describing a joyful relationship with God, but I do want you to know that this is the only way to true joy. Because God wants to be your joy. He wants you to enjoy the things that He gives, but He, he wants Himself to be your happiness. He wants Himself to be your life. And when we let Him be that, we find that life is better than we ever dreamed. Lord, I just want to thank you this morning for allowing us to take this.